It's Wednesday night, and once again, we can't be together. You know, I sure miss all you all. I miss my kiddos, I miss my family. I miss Monkey and Rufus. I miss the fun we have singing Baby Shark. Heck, I might even miss Hillbilly Dan just a little bit, but you guys don't need to tell him that. I miss our worship time. I miss singing praises to God with you all. But most of all, I miss praying with each of you. And since singing isn't something you would want me to do a solo on, why don't we just jump into the word tonight? But first, let's pray. Father, tonight, even though we can't all be together, we know that you are with us all. God, I just ask that tonight you speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. Help us to, to understand what it is that you want us to get from this message tonight. God, help me to, to deliver the words the way you would have them to be delivered. And help us to take them with us, meditate on them, talk to you about them, and make the right choices. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my title for tonight is this, something that we're not seeing a lot of these days, or we don't feel like we are, and that's living in the overflow. There was a time not so long ago where things seemed so great. Things were going well. People had jobs. Everything seemed to be good. May not seem quite that way right now. We've all been locked away, separated. Seem to be living a, a life that just doesn't even make sense. Everything's chaotic. We live in fear. We don't know what tomorrow will hold. But you know, our God does. And his word never changes. So tonight, I want to talk about living in the overflow and the power that we receive from that generosity that God gives us. It's a power of generosity. Because when God is wanting to send something to this earth, he is not looking for someone to send it to, or not just looking for someone to send it to. He's looking for someone to send it through. And by withholding what you could give, there is so much that you won't get. You know, people living with a spirit of generosity are much more invested in who they are than who they are blessing. What you give, it doesn't say so much about the person you're giving it to as it says about who you are. Now, that may sound backwards, but just listen. We are not generous and we don't give just because people need it. We give and are generous because it's what we need. We need that power unlocked within us and activated within our lives. Many of us, we think that generosity is something that may come someday. Believe me, I've been there. Someday, when we've made it, when we finish college, when we get married, we have that great job, we have a wonderful house, we have all that we want and need, our kids are grown. But that's not what generosity is about. Generosity isn't something we grow into. It's a spirit that we choose to carry with us every day. We have to learn to manage not only our money, but our time and possessions. Take responsibility for what that looks like and start bringing God what is his first. There's four characteristics that come to mind and need to be a part of this life for all of us, for every believer. Those four characteristics are these, tithing, offering, missional giving, and spontaneous giving. They're core places where we need to choose to live with a generous spirit. 
I'm sure every one of you have heard at least one message, probably many, on these principles, especially on tithing, maybe on missions. But just hearing doesn't change a thing. We have to apply them to our lives. And I'm going to challenge you to listen, to take notes, to pray, but most of all, to choose to give these principles a chance to change your life forever. You know, if if you receive any money at all for anything, for any reason, then you can give. I know many of you are thinking, hey, pastor, uh, just wait. I have to pay the rent. I've got insurance to pay. Oh, don't I know that? Got lots of that to pay these days. And we have to eat. And have you seen the price of hamburger these days? We have to get gas to go to work. Thank goodness that's a little cheaper. We've got to pay for the kids' college. My, co- my son needs new shoes. And I could go on and on. And have you ever wondered why there's never enough to go around? You know, I've got an idea on this. If God doesn't get what is his first, you'll always be trying to catch up. That's where this principle of tithing actually comes in. It is a very core principle. And the first one and the main one I want to talk about tonight. I've had lots of questions, especially recently, about what what does tithing actually mean? What really is it? There are a lot of discussions that take place about what a tithe is. Many people will say it's old covenant. Some will say, no, that's just new covenant. Well, how much is it actually? Do you pay it on your gross or your net? Well, what about the inheritance or the gifts you receive? I think that is something that you need to pray about and deal with God yourself with. But my personal belief, my conviction, after much prayer, our pastor's conviction and the conviction of this church is this. Tithing is not just an Old Testament law. It is a principle that when applied in our lives today will be fruitful for us all. So what is the tithe? Well, by definition, the tithe is a 10%. You know, I've heard people try to brag and say that they raise their tithe, that they're going to get 15% instead of 10%. But well, you know what? It's just not possible. Why? Because tithe literally means 10. It is a tenth of your increase, your paycheck, your social security, your disability, your gifts, whatever it may be. And if you do not bring your tithe to God, you are stealing it from him because it's his. It was his first. It still is. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will be busting with wine. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the tithe, the full tithe, into the storehouse, that there will be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Malachi 3, 11 and 12 goes on to say, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy your fruits and your vine in the field shall not fall, fail to bear. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Well, you know, let's back up just a little bit. Let's go back to Malachi 3, verse 7, which says this. From the days of our fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes 
and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob from God? Yet you are robbing from me. But you say, how have we robbed from you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing from me, the whole nation of you. When God gets the first 10%, the 90% is blessed. God can do so much more with the 90% that is left than any of us could do with the 100% if we tried to keep it and manage it for ourselves. So if you're looking for a way to get started in alignment with God, this is how to do it. Don't go out tonight and make yourself feel good and buy your neighbor a meal if you haven't paid your tithes. God has to come first. Don't be worrying about buying gifts for everyone if you haven't paid your tithes. It is paramount that you do this if you want to live a life that is blessed. Now don't get me wrong. Don't do it just to be blessed. But I think you're getting that picture. When Pastor and I began to do this, our whole lives changed. Even when things seem tough, even when we don't understand where it's going to come from, even when we don't see, we look back and we don't see how it could have happened. God has always been there. God has always taken care of it. And he is faithful to make sure that we are taken care of and have what we need. Everything shifts when you begin to put God first. Because like I said, if God is wanting to send money into the world, he's not going to send it to people who are going to hoard it up and keep it for themselves. He will send it to people he can move through. My personal conviction is also that we should tithe our time. Our time with God. Now I'm going to blow your mind a little bit. Maybe a whole lot. There are 24 hours in a day. I like math, so it's easy for me. But to help you guys out, because many of you don't even want to try to figure this out. There are 24 hours in a day. And I believe we owe God 10% of that as well. So what is that? 10% of 24 hours? That's 2.4 hours. That's right at two and a half hours a day. Are you spending two and a half hours per day in prayer, in Bible reading, in study? Boy, I'll tell you, when I thought about this, I thought many of us probably aren't spending two and a half hours a week, much less a day. I committed myself to doing some devotions and some different Bible studies and being part of some different groups this year. And I was a little worked up about it because it was taking me over two and a half hours a day to get that done. And I thought, man, Renee, you've overcommitted yourself. And then I got to thinking, if I owe God 10% of my time as a tithe, that's all I'm doing. I'm just paying my tithe. Not over and beyond. Just what is owed to him. I promise you that if you will try this, maybe you don't feel like you can make it happen. You can't make that two and a half hours happen. Extend what you're doing already. If you're doing zero, start doing some. If you're giving God a half hour a day, Increase it to 45 minutes a day. Increase it till you can get it to where it should be. I promise you that if you will do this, your life will change. It will be a blessing. The next practice that will help towards a life of overflow is our offerings. And when I was younger, I was a little confused when the pastor would get up and I'd say that he was going to take up tithes and offerings. I I often wondered, why is he repeating himself? Isn't offerings and tithes the same thing? Well, as I grew and as I, as I read, as I studied, I learned differently. 
I do understand now that tithes and offering are not the same. An offering is anything given over and above that tithe, whether it's in your money, in your giving, or in your time. If you don't tithe, then you can't give an offering until that 10% of your increase. Each penny, each moment you give is only part of that unfulfilled tithe, part of what you already owe. The people rejoiced over the offerings for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. That's 1 Chronicles 29, 9. We want to consistently give wholeheartedly. We want God to know that we know that our money and our time is better off in his hands than in our own. I know it is for me. The third thing that I had mentioned was missions giving. We need to give outside our own little personal bubble. We need to put money. Maybe we need to put some time in the hands of those that can reach the lost that we can't. Maybe you say, well, I can't go on a missions trip. I can't do those things. I, maybe you can't. I think you might be surprised, but maybe you can't. But you can still give up your time. You can pray for those missionaries. You can pray for those making those trips. You can pray for their safety. You can pray for open doors. You can pray for their financial needs. And we can give to missions. That also includes our home missions. Things that we do at home. Where we're reaching our own community. Reaching those around us. Matthew 25, starting in verse 34, says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and come visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. So in missions giving, it includes many things, some of which are these, home missions, U.S. missions, world missions, BGMC offerings, Life for the Lost, RWM projects, Speed the Light, many, many different givings that we can give our finances to. But more than that, while you're giving your two and a half hours of tithe time to, to God, pray for these. Pray for our home missions outreaches. Pray for our community. Pray for our church. Pray for our U.S. missionaries and the work they're doing. The world missionaries and the work they're doing for BGMC and the work it does around the world. Life for the Lost. Pray for the different projects that the WM ladies are doing. It's all important. You say, well, I can't remember all of that. I can't remember their names. Make a list. God's okay with that. And last but not least, there's a concept known as spontaneous giving. When the Lord speaks to your heart, Maybe impresses on you that you should give some stranger $20 or that you should buy someone's dinner. Maybe you should pay for that person behind you in line at the drive-thru. The measure of maturity in the life of a believer is how freely and gladly we give in that moment of spontaneity. Not just because we want to do it, not just because it's going to make us feel good, but because we've been in touch with God 
because we've prayed, because we've asked him to guide us, to guide our footsteps, to guide our giving, that we hear his voice and we're obedient to what he asks us to do. Proverbs eleven twenty four: give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. You know, I don't always recommend reading the message, but in this case, I wanted to share this. I, I love the way it puts this in Proverbs eleven twenty four through the message version. It says, the world of, a, of the generous gets larger and larger and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. That's not just our world as in our bank accounts, our possessions, the people around us, but it's all of these things included. And it's the world that we can influence. If money is tight, if time is tight, if you don't see how you're going to be able to get things paid, if you don't see how you're going to be able to get everything done. Is there some correlation between never having enough and how much you're giving? I mean, why should we worry about what we're giving when it's God's already and we serve a God who is more than enough? I challenge you and this year, but not just this year, for the rest of your life. But especially now as we're walking through this trying time. To look at where you stand in your generosity. I challenge you to walk in the power of this generosity. The world out there will ask, what does a man own? But God asks, how did he use it? The world's going to think more about money getting stimulus checks, unemployment. But Christ thinks about money giving. What are we using it for? What are we going to use that stimulus check for? Are we going to give God what is his? When a man gives, the world still asks, what did he give? How much did he give? Not Christ. Christ asked, how did he give it? The world looks at the money or the time and its amount. Jesus looks at the man and his motive. Generosity is not about the money. It's about people. When we open up our hands and give, open up our hearts and give, and give freely and gladly, a funny thing happens. We open, when our hands stretch out and open up, it puts us in a posture to receive. You know, John 3.16 is a very commonly known verse. Many of us can quote it. But it says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Not that he took, not that he demanded, not that he hoarded up, but that he gave his most prized possession, his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Did you realize that the hinge on which our entire faith exists, our entire faith is the most ridiculous act of generosity ever? I've learned personally that you can give without loving you can regret it later. You can have resentment. All kinds of things. You can, you can give without loving. You can give to make yourself look good. But you can't love without giving. So tonight, your challenge, my challenge, is this. Start tithing today. Not just your money. But more importantly, your time. We give God our time and the rest will come. The closer we are to him, the more likely everything else will fall in place. 
And while we're tithing our time, pray about our offerings, pray about our tithing. Pray for our community and our church. Pray for each other. Pray for our missionaries. If you need a list, ask Pastor and myself, we'll get you a list of names so you can pray for them by name. Pray for their families. Pray for their finances. Pray for their health. Pray for open doors for them. Pray for, for, for God to open those doors and to show you where we, he would have you to walk and the, give you the opportunities for spontaneous giving. It's not about the amount. It's about our motive. It's about being obedient. In Luke 21, it says, Jesus looked up and he saw them putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow. She put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of you. For they contributed out of their abundance. But she put, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had. You know, God doesn't look at how much we have, how much we give, how much we're doing. He looks to see about our motive and if we're being obedient to what he asks us to do. Today, I just challenge you to give it a chance. Isn't our God enough? Hasn't he always been there for us? Isn't he a good father? Hasn't he always been faithful? Trust him. Give him the opportunity to show you and to birth that power within you of generous, of being a, a, a generous, of, of having a, a, a generous spirit and live in the overflow of what God can pour out because he's always more than enough. Let us pray. Father, tonight, I just ask that you help us to hear your words. God, we thank you for always being there. We thank you for being a good father. We thank you for for always taking care of us and for never leaving us and for 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 walking hand in hand with us. For being there for us when we weren't even there for you. You sent your son, your prized possession out of your generosity for us even when we were sinners so that we would have an a chance at eternal life with you. Father, I just ask that you help us to learn your voice, to hear your voice, to have a desire to do what you would have us to do. And God, help us to see that abundance that you pour out on us. Help us to realize how much of an overflow we live in. God, speak to our hearts. Help us to make sure our motives are right, that our hearts are right, and that it's about you and not about us. Father, tonight I ask that as we come to an end of our time together here, that, that you would, would let each one of these people know that we're praying for them that we're speaking, taking them to you, that we're speaking to you about them. And God, I ask you to give them health, take care of them. Bless their finances. Bless their families. Bless this time that they have together. God, for those that are, that are out there working and are on the front lines of this craziness, help them with their sanity. Help combat their fear. Help them to know and when they're walking with you, they're protected. And God, help them to know that whatever happens, that you'll never leave them, you'll never forsake them, you'll always be there. And God, 
Help us to be able to come together again soon. Help us to be able to worship you together. But in the meantime, God, we just ask that you give us the opportunity to give. Not just to you, but those around us. Help us to, to further your kingdom by what we do. We give you all the praise and glory, God. And we thank you for all you've done for us. In your son's mighty name, amen.